this lawyer, scribe, if you will, or a theologian, a scholar came to Jesus and he wanted to know about how could he etern uh, gain eternal life? What shall I do? And Jesus answered and said these words. What is written in the law? How does it read to you? Different people read it differently. That's a good question. How do you interpret it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> now, he added that from Leviticus. That was not Deuteronomy there. That's Deuteronomy and Leviticus. <clears throat> now, I believe he added it because God had something to do with it. And this is what Jesus said to him. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I need a little, little insight on that. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus began to say these words. He replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem, not up to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among robbers and they stripped him, beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on the road. He wasn't going up to Jerusalem to the temple. He was headed back. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Let's just cut through the chase of all the religious explaining the Leviticus and all that. And let's just say, and he didn't help him. That's the bottom line. He what now? He didn't help him. The priest didn't help. Likewise, a Levite <clears throat> also, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. He did the same thing. The bottom line is, he didn't help him. And then a Samaritan, oh my God, a Samaritan. A no good Samaritan. Someone that they didn't put a high value on because of their status. He was on a journey and he came upon him and when he saw him, I like this, he did what? He felt compassion. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. I want to stop right there just a minute. When he saw him, which meant he took some time to look. Past few weeks, I've been looking at some research on the attention span of a human these days. Eight seconds. Eight seconds. The fruit fly is five seconds. The goldfish is nine seconds. Our attention span shifts. I'm not saying everybody, now listen to me. They did a survey. Eight seconds, our concentration on a certain subject matter is eight seconds. You could see it played out on TV, on, on the Internet, when you'd be watching a news clip or something to say, you can skip this in five, four, three. <laughs> you know why? <clears throat> they know you're not going to look at it. So whatever they got to say, they got to say it in five seconds. So by the time you click it off, They've got the main part of the message out. Look at the commercials on TV. Sometimes I wonder, are these companies just spending money for nothing? You ever watch those Geico commercials? What does all that got to do with insurance? Your attention. You know it's Geico at the end. Once they've captured you with their comedy, they got you. Nationwide insurance. All of them do the same thing. 
They know your attention span is short and you're only going to watch for a little while before you switch the channel or turn it off or do something. For this man to take time to see what was wrong, he had to have attention to the matter. He had to look at it and investigate it. He found that the man wasn't dead, something that the priest and the Levite didn't know. They didn't know if he was dead or not. They didn't take time to see. It's almost like a Facebook friend where it's electronic rather than personal and relational. Why do we call them friends? Are they compassionate friends? Why do we delete them every so often? <laughs> they somewhere during the course of the relationship, we cease to be friends. And technology has given me the power to wipe you out. Thank God for technology. <laughs> it takes time. If you're going to have compassion, it's going to take some time. Something that most of us don't have when it comes to things like this. Scientists are trying to study now, they are studying now, the difference between a fruit fly brain and a human brain. They think there's some correlation there because they gave the fruit fly Ritalin and it increased his attention span. What is happening to the attention span? All of this technology, it would seem to me that we should be getting smarter. But before all of this technology, 15, 16 years ago, our attention span was 12 seconds. Technology now is taking it away. We're not getting smarter. according to our own higher learning institutions who's doing this research and this big Fortune 500 companies are telling us we don't know how to concentrate on something for any length of time. Now that's not true in every case because I hope those air traffic controllers out there <laughs> are paying attention to what's coming in and what's going out out there on that airfield. I think it's important for us to learn something here from what Jesus is saying. And when he saw him, he did what? He had compassion on him. Romans 9, verse 23 and 24, I believe I said this, quote this last week. We are vessels of mercy. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. We are vessels of mercy. We have been committed to ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. That means we are to bring people back to God. We have to take the time to do that. Because when you reconcile both parties, or one party has thrown down his weapon. I'm no longer going to fight you anymore. I want to be reconciled. So God is looking for us to do what? Don't fight me. I've never fought you. I've always reached out to you. I've always wanted to save you. I always wanted you to come home. I told you in the prodigal son and so many other parables that Jesus spoke. It's God's way of telling us, I'm not your enemy. I'm your father. God wants us to see through his eyes and feel through his spirit. That's how he wants things done. Uh, the people God saw and the people God wanted to use and the people God paid attention to, it's not who the world wants us to give attention to. Now, the world have trained us. The world have taught us what value is. We join with the Christian community. We call the church and we come. Now we got to decide how much of this I'm going to let go. Now, I can't let it all go. Because in order to be successful and move up the corporate ladder. You got to know somebody. You got to be with the people in the know. 
You can't hang around with nobody's like the mailman in the mailroom. You got to be in the corporate boardroom. If you're going to make it big, you got to be with the big boys. So says the world. But that's not who God say you make it with. Listen to what scripture says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. Who wants the poor for a friend? Who wants somebody got nothing? God. Because there's value to them. Then he says in Matthew 18. Who then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So to be great, you got to have a different attitude. He calls it a childlike. Unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> we are constantly moving away from that. Understand what God is saying to us here. Being great and being first, who doesn't want to be great? Being great means you hang with great people. So we say, but here's what this Man, Jesus came along and introduced to the world it's, it's, it's not good to call people this, but it's called slaves. They're called who now? Slaves. Whoever wishes to be great among you should be your servant. But now the world has trained us to think if you want to be great, you can't be a servant. You got to be somebody who's being served. That's, that's, that's the standard. So we all look to be served instead of served. Jesus said, if you want to be great, whoever wishes you to be first among you shall be your slave. Wow. That's just totally opposite. There's no company that have that policy that I know of. All your great men are being served. They're not servants. And see, this is the transition our thinking must take when we come together like this. You don't go out there to be served. You go to serve. Jesus says, I come to give my life. I didn't come for people to bow down to me. Not now. But if I do what God tell me to do now, when it's all said and done, every knee going to bow and every tongue going to confess. You got to see what's coming. You got to know what God is doing. I'm calling you now to do a work for me. And when it's time for elevation, you will get your position. What about people? Jesus said, put a value on your enemies. Put a value on them. He said, love them. Pray for them. People who persecute you. What Paul did to the church. He said, I persecuted the church. I troubled it. I put pressure on it. I tried to wipe them out. Jesus said, put value on that person. You don't see that. I, I, I know. I know. I understand. You put value on them and pray for them. Call out to me for them. And bless them. If they're hungry, feed them. Put value on your enemies. Now that is so radical. What, what is this? No wonder they call Jesus crazy. This is not the way the world trained us. 
This is not why I joined the church. This is not why I come to church. I don't come to church to be last. I don't come to church to be no servant. That's not why I come. What do you, what do you, what do you come for? Because I got promoted and I'm the vice president. And Jesus is still the king. So how can we be great? How can we be what God wants us to be if we look past what he says it takes to be great? How can we be first if we look past what he says it takes to be first? It's a different road that we take rather than the world the world taught us to take. In life, we value the rich and the famous. We value them. They can make things happen for us. You know, it says it all depends on who you know. You know the right people, I can get you to that company. You got to know somebody to get the job there. That's the worldly view. Because we believe success is dependent upon who you know. The more powerful, the more better. The higher they are in the corporate world, the better it is for us. So we think. And we live like that. And we come to church and we sing and we pray and we walk out with the same mindset. Do you know anybody that works over there? God says the poor bless, not the rich. Paul tells Timothy to warn the rich. Jesus says, hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. He didn't say it was impossible. Warn them that they don't trust in uncertain riches. And the Beatitudes, when Jesus spoke to him, he said, blessed are you poor. He never said anything about the rich, but you read about the rich in the scripture. You just find some things that are totally contrary to what we believe about being rich. The servants and slaves will be first. The greater. The servants and slaves will be first. The greater one will not be the master today. But we're not getting prepared for that. We're trying to hold on to the systems of this world. We, 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 we want things the way the world say things would be. And Jesus is trying to tell us, you're not going to end up that way. The enemies that we have should help build our prayer life. They shouldn't be looked down on. You are, you, I mean, to, to help build your prayer life, to help build your meditation life, to keep you before God, thank God for that. They have a value. Everything that God put around you, you must put a value on it, especially humans, every last one of them. If they there, see the value that God put them there for and not the reason you don't want them there. Your enemy should build your prayer life. You're not praying, then you don't have enemies. This is the calling of God upon our lives. Our relationship should extend to every man. Say every man. See, when you follow Jesus, you learn some things about God that you really have to sit down and decide whether you want to continue to follow or not. And see, this is where I believe the church should really, really stress what Jesus wants. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and yesterday morning as a matter of fact and he was sharing with me how this friend of his attends this church and she said really I, I really want to learn more about Jesus but all they talk about is prosperity I don't want to leave my church because I, I love the church but I'm, I'm tired of the prosperity message now, this is literally his words to me what do I tell her Hmm. Is there prosperity outside of Jesus? 
maybe I missed something. I have to continue reading the Bible over again. Maybe I run across it. But listen at what God is saying to his people today. As I go deeper and deeper into this Samaritan situation. Who is God putting value on? Poor people. Children. Slaves. People who are servants. Enemies. Put a value on them. Put a value on them. The world encourages us to ignore them. That's what they do. They're no benefit to the great, the power, and the mighty. How can you help me move up the corporate ladder? And all you do is work down in the basement. You can't help me get up the ladder. See, the Samaritan helped the man who was his enemy. And, and the name was meant so little to the scribe. When Jesus asked him, which one do you think was the neighbor? He didn't even say the Samaritan. He said the one who helped him. <laughs> who is my neighbor? That's good. So now every time you help somebody or you did something for somebody, you got a blessing for God. Man, the world would be full of blessings. If God paid out right then, man, you did this, ma'am. You gave the man on the corner five dollars, ma'am, here's 50. Everybody would be nice. I mean, every day, all the time, because they see the reward, they get the reward. Didn't God promise us a reward? Didn't God tell us he's not unrighteous to forget your work and live? Didn't God say that? Where's your faith? Didn't God say, I repent, he that considered the poor lendeth to the Lord, and that which he has given, God will repay him. And I want to tell you something, God is no man's debt now. God's not in no man's debt. Nobody can get on their knees and say, God, you owe me, I helped that man. Would you stop because you don't have your reward? Where is the motivation? If I just kept giving, 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 helping, 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 I never got anything. I don't believe it's the church wanting to stop. I believe it's the influence of the world that's telling us, don't pay them people no attention. They can't do nothing for you. But God say they're full of rewards. We'd rather look to the powerful and the mighty for a reward when God is offering us one. To be a kind, generous person, a forgiving person, is there no reward in that? Is there a reward? Is, is God going to do anything about that? This Samaritan <laughs> helped this man. Now, it was, it was a name or it was part of a group nobody wanted to be identified with. And I, I want to point some things out about the Samaritan. We'll move on. In Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent out the 12 on a specific mission, listen to what he say. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritan. Don't go to Samaritan. This is a specific mission to the Jewish people. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. That's Matthew chapter 10. Boy, that's, that's just something. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through verse 56, you would find Jesus, when he got ready to go to Jerusalem, the scripture says, he sent messenger ahead of him and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. 
They went into this village of the Samaritans and they didn't value each other. They didn't value each other. What was supposed to happen didn't happen. Now watch what scripture says. But they did not receive him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. You have the wrong nationality. You going where those Jews go. They didn't receive him. Are you with me here? They didn't receive him. So if you think we're having social problems today, we've been having problems from the beginning of time. In the book of Acts, it tells us why the apostles say, look out among you and get men full of the Holy Spirit whose wisdom who we may appoint on this business because the Greek-speaking Jews who are called the Grecians, they felt like they had been neglected in the daily administration of food and stuff. So they went and says, we've been overlooked. Why? You the wrong nationality. This is why we have, we don't have the church today. It's got to be an African-American church. It's got to be an AME church. It's got to be this church. It's got to be that church. What happened to Jesus? What happened? Why well, can't be the church of the Lord Jesus? Why do we have to identify who we are? Some people don't put value on African-Americans. So they're not coming here. But they love Jesus. <laughs> Samaritans didn't receive Jesus' disciples. Look what these brothers do. Are you with me here? Look what these brothers did. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire? You want us to smoke them? <laughs> we'll call fire down right now. Nobody rejects Jesus. You see kind of value they had on people? We'll burn them up. We don't care. We'll call fire down from heaven. From heaven. They're going to put God in this mess. But he turned and rebuked them. You do not know what kind of spirit you are. You don't know why you said that. That's the wrong spirit. That's what now? That's the wrong spirit. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went on to another village. Thank God Jesus was there. How do you value people? Look around. There's some people you put more value on than others. There's some people you just can't see to make it with. As if they mean nothing to you. On his way to Jerusalem between Samaria and Galilee he entered the village and there were ten lepers there. Lepers. Now they couldn't get close to Jesus. They hollered out with a low voice. They hollered out. Because the law required them to stay so far away. And they raised their voices. Master, master, have mercy on us. Jesus didn't say, is that a bunch of lepers? Man, let's go. No. No, he puts value on them. Go show yourself to the priests. Do what the law say do. Just go. He didn't go over there and lay hands on them. <laughs> he just said, what? Go, show yourself to the priest. And they started walking to the priest. And as they were walking, one of them noticed. Oh, my God. I don't. Oh, my God. Before he went to the priest, he ran back to Jesus. And thanked him. The Bible says he fell down prostrate before him. And thanked him. Now here's the key. He was a Samaritan. He was a Samaritan. Jesus said, wasn't it ten? Where the other nine? You mean you the only stranger? You the only one that we supposed to hate came back and told me thank you? Oh man. Wow. What were 
Jews are the nine. You think they were all Samaritans? Oh, no. Some were Jesus' nationality. You know the story about the woman at the well, so we won't stay there. Here's what the woman said. How is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? You know you all don't have no relationship with us. But the woman had value. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. The woman had value. And God sent Jesus to her. We're afraid of people that's not like us. What do they call it? Uh, uh, some kind of phobia? We're afraid of people not like us. You, we are afraid of people who we don't value. That's who we're afraid of. We're afraid of people who are not on our level or above us. Or we can gravitate to that. That's why everybody want to be a movie star or a singer or a rapper. There's some kind of recognition to that. But I'll never be recognized sitting a bunch of church people. I'll never be recognized if I'm not in Hollywood or whatever the case may be. There's no value on us that the world going to look to. And nobody's helping me out now, I guess. I'm in the wilderness now. I might as well enjoy it. In John 8, 48, Jesus and the Jews had a conversation. They said, and he said, you, 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 you can read. It's kind of, kind of, kind of long, John 8. But in verse 48, here's what they said to Jesus. Do we not say rightly that you are Samaritan? You act just like them half-breeds. And have a demon. And you're full of the devil. What kind of words is that to say to the Lord Jesus? You just like those Samaritans and you're full of the devil. Jesus said, I don't have a demon. I don't have a demon. Not only did they say that, they said he has a demon. He's insane. He's out of his mind. He's delirious. Something's wrong with this man. Come with all this teaching and all this stuff. When Paul stood before a group in Festus to give his his defense, he started talking about the scripture to the point that Festus hollered out, Paul, Paul, you done read too many books. Much learning that made you insane, man. You start talking about Jesus. So now to follow Jesus, why do we appear to be insane? Why do we appear to be out of our minds? Why do we appear to be we like the term crazy, mad. Now, if you plan on following Jesus all the way, you're going to have to get used to all this insults and name calling from the world. All right. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what Jesus said. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. I didn't come what now? This is what we say. My teachings are controversial. And they're going to divide a home. They're going to divide. Everybody won't be able to agree with it. I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. When you mean you didn't come to bring peace. Peace comes inside of us. Not outside. And it never amazes me, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't amaze anybody who understands what God is saying. Why is everybody in the world trying to have peace? Let me take you a few scriptures. Why is everybody trying to have peace? Why couldn't the Jews have peace with the Samaritans? Whoa. Why are we always talking about race relations today as if it's going to happen because we sit down and talk to each other? Hmm. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. 
I didn't fail in my mission for the world to be in condition that it's in. I didn't fail in my mission. He said, my peace I leave with you. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. So you better get out the world. They'll never have peace. Peace. My peace, I leave with you. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Peace is a result of being justified and know you justified and know God has forgiven you. That's peace. I can live in the midst of confusion. They're looking for something that they never have. Since the fall of man, since sin entered the world, the world has not known peace, and the world will not know peace. It's those who are in the world that have Jesus in them. That's the only peace you're going to have. So when you operate with Jesus in you before the world, you look crazy. You look like you don't have sense. Because you have what they don't have. You know what they don't know. You can feel what they can't feel. That's why when he saw him, he had something the priest didn't have. And that's Jesus' point. You could be full of religion and miss God. Here's what he said. You could be a priest and don't have inside of you what needs to be inside of you. You'll miss it. They miss what God wanted them to hit. Why? They didn't have peace. No peace in the world. There's no peace out there. Come on. There's no peace out there. My peace I leave with you. And I'm giving it to you. Not like the world gives. The world gives peace. And two days later, there is no more peace. And that's not how God wants us as his people to operate. We don't operate with each other one week, then the next week we don't have peace. What is that? If it's in you, it's in you. Here's what we say. Peace comes as a result of being justified. When you know you've been justified. When you know your sins have been forgiven. When you know God is with you. Then you can live with any and everybody. Jesus' teaching was so radical. Jesus was so controversial. He said, one in the house going to believe me and one not going to believe me. I believe it was in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 2. Revelation 2 verse 12, I had it backwards. I'm going to read this to you about what John saw in the last days. On the Isle of Patmos, John saw something. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. And to the angel of the church, listen carefully. Pergamum right. The one who had the sharp two-edged sword says this. What does he say? I know where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. My witness. My faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Move on. But I have a few things against you. You have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, some among you, in your same group, in your same fellowship, got a whole different teaching. Believe a whole different thing. Are you listening to me? Look at the scripture. Who keep teaching Balaam Balaam, who kept teaching Balaam to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. You know that story. If you don't, we have to deal with it another time. He put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to Adam and to commit acts of immorality. He knew how to get God against them. And read on what this so. So, you also have some in the same way Hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Look at, listen, listen at what Jesus is getting ready to say. Therefore, repent. Listen, listen, listen. Let's read it. Repent or I am coming to you quickly. And I will make war not against you. 
the church, but against them in the church who are hypocritical and got all these beliefs about certain things. I'm coming to wage war. I come to wage war. I'm not fighting my church. He says, some in there. Now, 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 now listen. I come to wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm going to send my word. I'm going to do what now? If there's a different mindset, if there's a different teaching against what Jesus taught, he's against it. I will war against them because I love my church. I love my people being taught to follow me. I want that to continue. So some people say, well, it's a lot of hypocrites are there. Just make sure you not. <laughs> just, 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 that's, that's all you be concerned about. They ain't coming back in groups. We're going to stand before God one by one. One by one. The promise of peace is, 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 is it's not a universal peace, but it's an individual peace. We all have to have it individually. You got to have peace within. These things I've spoken to you that in me, that in where? You may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take courage. I did what? I've overcome the world. Hatred, murder. All the evil against man. You know the result? What is the result of no inner peace? That only comes from Jesus. Why is one group against another group? Nation against nation. Why is that? They don't have peace. There's no inner peace. There's no inner peace. If I can't get along with people, it shows that something is wrong inside of me. It's me and me. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Peace is the result of being justified, we say. Peace is the result of what now? Being justified. When the man had compassion, the Samaritan man had compassion on the man. He showed something in what was inside of him. The word compassion, and I want to take these last few minutes to tell you about compassion. Or to speak to you from the word of God. It's a body word. Compassion is something that the Hebrews call the womb. And the womb has been considered the safest place it is for a child before he's born. You couldn't get no safer than a mother's womb. It's her innermost part. The Greek call it the guts. The body parts inside. It's something that moves beyond feelings and emotion. It's something that God allows to happen in us that moves us. It's not pity. It's not sympathy. Every time I see somebody and say, well, I'm, man, I, I just feel so sorry for that person. We all have those feelings, don't we? You've probably seen some people last week you felt sorry for. But what did you do? It's just a feeling. You have my sympathy. Okay. <laughs> we throw these words around, man, like that. They don't mean nothing. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, what are you doing? When the leper says, Jesus helped me say, I feel so sorry for y'all. <laughs> when he came to the village name. The Bible said a widow had her only son and they were carrying him to the cemetery. And the woman was so distraught, she was so distressed, she didn't know what to do. And the scriptures say, and when Jesus saw her, he had compassion. Something happened on the inside of him. That's what it was. That's what it is. It wasn't a pity feeling. It wasn't sympathy. It was the what I call the embodiment of God in this man that stirred him. And I believe we're going to see some great miracles when we let God stir us to action. Are you listening to me? 
And Jesus saw that woman and he was felt so sorry. What was this woman going to do? She had nobody to take care of her, her son, her only son. And the funeral procession was coming by. Jesus let it walk on by. He, the Bible says he just touched the briar. That is the thing that the coffin, coffin be on. He just touched that and said, boy, get up. And he got up. See, compassion moves you to action. If you feel sorry for me, then what are you doing? Do something then. If I'm that bad, do something. <laughs> Are you with me? It's a compassion. Compassion says all of my human tenderness and every bit of mercy in me is moved. If I have mercy and tenderness inside of me, there's certain things that should move me to action. It's, it's very difficult to achieve in some people. You know why? We substitute it for pity. Sympathy. But compassion is something you feel. And it moves you to do something. About whatever the person is going through. Compassion say, do something. The compassion say, what now? Do something. Like the centurion. He helped this man. He had no worldly reason to help him. There was no benefit at all to him. As a matter of fact, he probably would have been talked about if he went back and said, well, I helped that Jewish fellow, whatever kind of nationality he was. Man, you crazy. You know them people don't like us. But compassion say what? Do something. What do we feel when we see suffering in people who have lost in life, who have nothing? In some way they have failed, they've missed the mark, and they feel so down, and they feel so downhearted. I heard a man once say, we was listening to something, and he said, when people, these women and these men out there get in trouble, they can't come to the church. Because the church going to talk about them. The church going to criticize them and ostracize them because they're not like us. How can a prostitute, how can a man who has actually lost in life and was kicked out, his wife left him, how can he come to us? Where would the compassion be to reach out to that man or that lady or that family and say, we're going to do something about this. Now that's compassion. That's compassion. But people are afraid of the church. People who are in deep trouble, they're afraid of us. What do you feel? The priest and the Levite, they, they felt nothing. That's why they kept on going. They didn't care. When the prodigal son left, the Bible said the father had compassion on him. He had what now? There was a slave who owned the king 10,000 talents, and there was no way he could pay him back. He owed him 10,000 talents. And no way to pay him back. The king said, sell him, sell his wife, sell his children, and everything he got, and pay me my money. The man fell down to the king. He said, have mercy on me. The Bible says, and the king did what? Have compassion. When people come to you crying and say, would you forgive me? Yeah, but I won't forget. <laughs> I forgive you, but I ain't going to forget it. That's all he got to give is his brokenness. Would you have compassion on me? Would you be moved to do something so I can move closer to God? Would you help me find God? Sometimes I wonder, you know, I watch some of these television, bro. What the world's going on in America today? How could we be in church 15, 20 years and never know what compassion is? 
You need compassion to operate in the gifts. You need compassion to serve in the church. You need compassion to do anything for God because it's nothing but the embodiment of God in a person. That's God. It's not just more of an emotion. It's more God than the emotion. Are you listening to me? There's no sense for not one part of this body, not one member, to be without food and clothes. It's, it's, it's no sense for it to happen. Where's the compassion? We talk about our large numbers and let me know how large your heart is. Really impress me with your heart. Tell me how many in there are not hungry. Tell me how many you providing for. Then I will consider your work for God. Compassion is not used just to show or describe some human emotion. Compassion is what characterizes Christ. Compassion say your attitude has changed. Compassion say what now? My attitude has changed. To be moved with compassion is to be moved from the deepest part of your body Beyond your feelings, it's deeper than that. Pity God's feelings. You could pity somebody because you feel sorry. It could just be a bunch of words we've learned. Jesus didn't heal people and help people and forgive people because he was trying to impress somebody. He did it because he embodied God. And the world never knew God on that level. We do it because we embody Christ. He is the fullness of the Godhead in the body form. And if you're full of Jesus, you've got to be full of compassion. It's a contradictory term. You have Jesus, now compassion. That's almost just say, I'm living and I don't need oxygen. They go together, people. They go together. Jesus, Jesus is synonymous with what? Compassion. Jesus is synonymous with mercy. Jesus is synonymous with love. How can you have these without Jesus? It's impossible. Compassion is what Jesus showed us when he hung on the cross. Compassion is what it felt like to be in a sinner's body. Ugh. Did I lose you at the cross? Compassion is what it feels like when Jesus died. This is what it feels like to be in a sinner's body. Because God made him sin who knew no sin. He put it on him. And Jesus felt what it was like to be in a body wrecked by sin. It was hurtful. It was lonely. It was painful. He was away from God. That's how people feel. But they try to do their best to express a side of them that they know we might accept. I can't show you my hurt, my pain. Because you don't have compassion. You would ostracize and criticize you would send me deep into the dungeon. I can't tell you my deepest pain. How I long to be delivered. But everybody's so caught up on blessed and highly favored. I can't tell you how deep this pain is from the past. And I sit among you and I worship with you and I sing with you and I'm hurting. Would God touch somebody in here with compassion to come and minister to my knee? Here they are. The woman at the well is here. The lepers are here. You know, leprosy could be a, the, the color of our skin. Leprosy could be where I come from. Everybody got a form of leprosy, something 
you crying out to God for him. And when he saw him, Jesus, and when what now? What scripture say? He had Not only did he have compassion, he did something about it. Picked the man up, washed him up, fixed him up, took him to the inn, and he told the innkeeper, I'm going to say hotel. Listen, you take care of this man. And when I come back here, here, I'm going to leave you a little something, but when I come back, if I owe you anything, I'm going to pay it. And he was his enemy. This is where we're going this year, church. Get ready for it. It's radical. This is where we're going. If you're going to follow Jesus, quit thinking the way the world told you to think. Put value on everybody. Everybody means something to God. They didn't go down and do anything to that woman in Samaria until Jesus got there. And when that woman got through with that small talk with Jesus, and when she went and told those people what Jesus had done for her, it just revitalized the whole community. And they say uh, they wanted Jesus to stay with them. He stayed there two more days. They invited a Jew to stay in Samaria. Why? Because.